Hello again. Um, so we just left off in the last video that King Lear walked out of Reagan's castle because he was so upset with both of his daughters, Goneril and Reagan. Um, and the Earl of Kent and the Fool followed him. Um, okay. Oh, and before he left, he, he told them that he would have revenge on both of them. Um, so he's threatening his daughters now. Wonderful. So this is after he walked out. A spiteful smile spread across Reagan's face. To willful men, the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. She turned to the Earl of Gloucester. Shut up your doors. So she's telling him to close his doors. And she said, to willful men, the injuries that they themselves procure must be their schoolmasters. So she's saying that, um, men who are willful, so men who try and persuade other people to follow whatever they want, um, the only way that they can learn is by messing up themselves, pretty much. So she's saying the only way her father will learn is by whatever happens to him will hopefully teach him something, right? Um, the bleak winds do sorely ruffle, Gloucester objected. Um, So then, by no means, entreat the king to stay, Garnel commanded. So I think Gloucester wants the king, and Reagan is saying, or Garnel is saying, um, don't let the king stay here anymore. Like, that's not okay. Um, outside the castle's stone walls, Lear defiantly faced the growing tempest. Blow, winds, and crack your cheeks, he cried. Rage, blow, rumble thy bellyful, spit fire, spout rain. The tempest in my mind doth from, from my senses take all feeling. So he's saying, go ahead and, and let it rain and, and blow fire and all the winds. And he says he doesn't, he doesn't care because he can't feel any of that because inside of himself is so emotional. <laughs> and so um, he, he feels like he's going crazy, right? Um, lightning flashed and thunder cracked as if in response. Having scouted the area, Kent fought his way back through the storm to his king. Gracious, my lord, hard by here is a hovel. Kent took Lear's arm and led him toward the small rough hut, so they found like a little place to stay. As they made their way across the desolate heath, um, Lear squinted into the storm. Poor naked wrenches, wretches, that by the pelting of this pitiless storm, how shall your houseless heads and unfed, um, and unfed sides defend you? He remembered all the riches he had enjoyed while so many of his subjects lived in poverty. Oh, I have taken too little care of this, the king realized. Oh, so now he's realizing that while he was king all these years, all the poor people who lived in his kingdom really had a horrible life, right? They had to, if it was raining or if there was a storm going on, they only had their small little homes. They didn't have a huge castle to stay in. Um, so, just like Goneril said, he's learning through actually having to endure all these things, right? Um, that's the only way he'll learn, is to see it for himself. Inside the hovel, they discovered a wretched man dressed in nothing but a rough blanket. What art th thou? Kent asked, so he's saying, who are you? Beneath the grime and matted hair was Gloucester's good son, Edgar. <gasps> So Edgar, the one who uh, Edmund told to run away, right, because the king was out to get, or the earl was out to get him, um, so he went into hiding, right? So this is Edgar. Um, thanks to Edmund's lies, Edgar could not flee Britain. Soldiers were in every port watching for him. It was much safer to dwell in the shadow of his father's castle. There, Edgar called himself Tom and pretended to be a lunatic beggar. So let's add that. Edgar is pretending to be Tom. This is poor Tom, Edgar jobbered. When the foul fiend rages, eats cow dung for salad, swallows the old rat and the ditch dog, drinks the green scum of the standing pool. He scratched violently at one ear. Allow, allow, loo, loo. So he's just trying to sound crazy so that they don't listen to him. And he spoke in the third person about himself. He said, this is poor Tom, but he's talking about himself. Um, so 
he's just trying to sound as crazy as possible so that they don't recognize him and know that he's Edgar. Lear watched in amazement. He felt a similar wildness growing in his mind. So Lear is saying that he feels like he's going crazy too, right? Which is not the first time he said this. Inside the castle, Gloucester prepared the brave to brave the storm. So that means he's, he's going to try and get ready to go outside into the storm. If I die for it, the king, my old master, must be rescued, he confided to his son Edmund. So he's going to go out into the storm to try and save the king, which is very kind. The old earl also said that he had received word that Cordelia and the French army had landed at Dover. They planned to rescue Lear and avenge all insults against him. Disobeying the orders of his royal visitors, Gloucester gathered supplies for the king. So even though Goneril and Reagan told Gloucester, don't go after him, he's crazy, just leave him alone. They obviously don't care about their father. Gloucester is going to go out into the storm and look for him anyway. Edmund rushed to tell Goneril and Reagan and her husband, Cornwall, um, all that his father had reported. In gratitude for this treachery, Cornwall denounced Gloucester and gave Edmund his father's title and land. Oh, great. So Edmund um, went to Goneril and Regan and the Duke of Cornwall and told them that the Earl of Gloucester, his father, um, is going to go help the king. And so now Cornwall um, told Edmund, he said, okay, well now Gloucester is basically fired from his job. He's, he doesn't have the title of Earl anymore. He loses his land, he loses his title, and it all goes to Edmund, which is Edmund's goal, right? He wants his father's land and title. Um, he then directed Edmund to accompany Goneril back to her castle so she could warn her husband, Albany, about the coming French invasion. The revenge we are bound to take upon your treacherous father are not fit for your beholding, Cornwall told Edmund. Meanwhile, Gloucester, realizing the daughters wanted their father dead, made his way out of the castle. Oh. So does Gloucester know that he's been denounced? I don't know. We'll see. He hadn't left the castle yet, so he might know. Um, hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, he headed out across the rain-swept heath in search of his king. He found Leah ranting with a filthy madman in the hovel. <laughs> so they're both sounding crazy, right? King Lear and the Earl of Kent. No, sorry, not the Earl of Kent. King Lear and um, Edgar disguised as Tom, right? They're both sounding crazy. Lear pretended to be in a court of law. He made the fool and the madman Tom act the part of his daughters. Lear put them on trial for their inhuman behavior. So he's telling um, Tom and the Earl of Kent to pretend to be Goneril and Regan, and he's saying um, he's saying that they have to go to prison because they didn't treat him right. He's just, I don't know, he's kind of being crazy and hallucinating. Appalled at the state of his royal lord, Gloucester urged Kent and the fool to carry the now surly man, the, the surely mad king, toward Dover, where Cordelia's troops would help them. Then Gloucester secretly returned to his own castle. Oh no, okay. Okay. So I think Gloucester does know that he's been denounced. Because um, why else would he go back to his kingdom secretly? Um, so I think what I'll do is I will just cross this off because he's no longer Earl. He's just Gloucester. <laughs> okay. So as soon as he reached the castle gates, two guards seized him. They hauled Gloucester before Reagan and Cornwall and bound him to a chair. Reagan denounced him as a traitor for helping her father and not reporting the arrival of the French army. Cornwall towered over the old Earl with malicious pleasure. He gouged out one of Gloucester's eyes. Oh my God, gross. Okay. Out, vile jelly, Cornwall sneered. Where is thy luster now? One side will mock the other, Reagan laughed cruelly. The other two. Cornwall's servants were shocked by this barbarity. 
One drew his sword and tried to stop his master. The servant mortally wounded Cornwall, but not before Regan ran him through with his sword. So one of Cornwall's servants um, decided to stab Cornwall because he's like, oh my gosh, you're being so, so awful with the Gloucester. Um, so he mortally wounded him. So that means Cornwall is probably going to die, right? He got very, very badly hurt. Um, but Regan, um, the Duke of Cornwall's wife, right? She killed the servant. Um, <laughs> so Cornwall hauled himself to his feet. With great effort, he plucked out Gloucester's other eye. Ew! So before he died, he had to take out both his eyes. Oh my god. Gloucester screamed for his younger son, Edmund, and kindle all the sparks of nature to revenge this horrid act. So he's calling to his, who he thinks is his loyal son, right? When he's really the not excellent son. Um, Reagan leaned over Gloucester's bloody, unseen face. Thou callest on him that hates thee, she spat. It was Edmund that made the overture of thy treasons to us. She turned her back. Go thrust him out at gates and let him smell his way to Dover, she cried to her servants. So basically, Reagan just went and told Gloucester, you're calling Edmund, but he's the one who actually betrayed you, not Edgar. Um, so man, so this poor guy, both his eyes get gouged out. Yay. And uh, I think the Duke of Cornwall is dead. Um, oh, well, he's still dying. He jumped a little ahead, but let's see. Um, so as Regan knelt before her dying husband, an old servant untied Gloucester and led him out of the castle and onto the heath. In short time, they ran into the lunatic beggar, Tom, who's really Edgar, right? Um, Gloucester listened to his raving, but did not recognize Tom as his son, Edgar. Edgar was anguished to see his father's wounds. He cried out, but in gibberish, still playing the lunatic. So he doesn't want his father to recognize him. The blind Earl knew the old servant was, the old servant with him could not travel far. So he asked the crazy beggar to lead him instead to a high sea cliff in Dover. As they traveled, Gloucester bemoaned what fate had dealt him. As flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, the old Earl said, they kill us for their sport. So he's just feeling really sorry for himself, which I understand. Going blind sounds pretty awful. Um, the blind man and the beggar near the cliffs of Dover. Edgar, still undetected, saw that his father intended to leap to his death. So he instead brought Gloucester to a low hill and convinced him that the cliff lay below. <laughs> oh no. So Edgar's realizing that Gloucester, his father, told him he wants to go to a cliff so that he can kill himself because he's so sad. Um, so Tom instead was like, oh, here, Dad, here, here's this cliff, and it's actually just a little hill, so there's no way he can hurt himself. Um, if Edgar live, oh, bless him, Gloucester cried. Then he hurled himself forward. The old man fainted before he hit the soft earth. <laughs> Edgar gently roused his father and, putting on a different accent, swore that he had seen Gloucester fall from a great height. The old man was astounded that the gods had protected him. He vowed to never again try to take his own life. So now Edgar, or Tom, is pretending to be someone new. So he's now a third person um, who's pretending to just have seen Gloucester jump from a high cliff and saying, Oh my gosh, you jumped from a high cliff and you survived! And so now Gloucester feels better about himself. And um, he's saying he's never going to try that again. How much time has passed? Uh, okay, we are going to stop here again um, and continue next time. Bye!